Okay, so we're going from underwater to terrestrial. Very, very terrestrial. Um, I changed the, the name of the, the talk a little bit. I called it Citizen Science and Monetary Mysteries, A Historic Journey, because I thought it was really important um, the first evening when we, when we heard uh, Alan Finkel talk and saying, you know, what is um, citizen science? When did it start? Well, it started a long time ago, and I, I have to say, probably I'm very selfish because, you know, I, I have concentrated on one species. So it's not like, you know, we've heard about all these big projects, all these different species and everything going on. Uh, it's just been one. So my, my journey has been 30 years. So I have been studying the same species 30 years, but it's not just the echidna. I actually um, came in 1988 to look at tiger snakes, and um, I couldn't get a full postdoctoral grant. To, to work with a reptile, so I had to work with a reptile and mammal. And I thought, well, echidnas were okay because they were an egg-laying mammal and a life-bearing reptile. And I'm really, you know, into reptiles, and so also I've been working with Rosenberg's gland. So these are the animals I've been working with for the last 30 years, and also working with citizen scientists. Now, a lot of people have heard of Kangaroo Island, but I've met some people here at the conference who actually don't know where Kangaroo Island is. Um, so it is actually Australia's third largest island and it has all kinds of different attributes, but a couple things we don't have are rabbits and foxes, which makes it really good for uh, terrestrial studies. And in fact, we call Kangaroo Island a biological window into the past because there's a lot of species there interacting, plant and animal species interacting much as they did pre-European time. So it's a very important area. Um, I live and work around the Pelican Lagoon area. Well, I work across the island, but um, I live in that small area. Okay, so I was talking about citizen science, you know, and when did it actually start with echidnas? Well, the first echidna was collected in 1791, and um, it was found by a person called John White, which was presented to a captain, and then it was sent to England, and it arrived in 1792. So that was sort of the beginning of um, monitoring science and, you know, and things we didn't know. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Richard Owen, but he was the founder of the British Natural History Museum. He was also who, the fellow who, termed, who co uh, coined the term dinosaur, so that's what he's holding right there. And he actually got a lot of these really weird specimens from Australia to do descriptions. Now this was 40 years after the first echidna had been sent to the UK. And at that time, in 1832, he posed a number of questions. He said, we have learned everything we can from these dead specimens. And now there are a series of questions that we're never going to answer unless we actually study these animals in the field. And the questions were mainly about reproduction. So how did they mate? When did they mate? Gestation period? How is the fetus nourished? Of course, at this time, they didn't know they were egg-laying. Size and condition of young? How long is it suckled? And what age are they sexually mature? So those questions were posed in 1832. Now, it was only a couple years later, no, actually quite a few years later, that young George Bennett, who was also a naturalist and you could call him a citizen scientist, he went to um, Australia and he was really interested. He really wasn't sure if the echidna laid an egg or if it was life bearing. So he wanted to collect some specimens and sent them back to the now aging Richard Owen uh, to try to find out if they were egg laying or not. Um, but no, that wasn't discovered. However, <coughs> fairly soon after that, oh, and he produced another question. How often do echidnas reproduce? So we're getting all these questions that hadn't been answered. Um, this fellow, Albert Mulano, he was very important to South Australia. He was actually an agriculturalist, and he went out and he invented a lot of things, a lot of the first troll fishing he did, and he actually um, was a citizen scientist because he took all his things to the South Australian Museum. And from him, I think, 340 new species of fish were actually described. But he also went to Kangaroo Island quite often. And it was his initiative that in August 1884, he collected two echidnas, so-called in copulation. Now, unfortunately, the notes from that time were not very good, so we don't have the exact timing of when he collected those echidnas. But he took those echidnas back to the South Australian Museum. That's where William Hawker was the acting director at that time. And it was the 25th of August that Hawker, with a helper, went down and was going to examine these echidnas, hopefully to find a baby echidna because no one had ever seen one. But he didn't find a baby echidna, he found an egg. And on examining that first egg, that first echidna egg, he squished it. So that was the beginning. So it had taken scientists 92 years to, to discover that monotremes um, were egg-laying mammals. So things then started to happen fairly quickly as far as trying to learn out about, try to learn about this iconic and very weird species. So 
So it was in 1885 that Caldwell, who was um, a Scottish bloke, um, employed 150 local people to help capture echidnas. This was in the Burnett district of Queensland. And in a three week period, he collected between 1,300 and 1,400 echidnas. Now that is incredible. I've never heard of numbers like that before. He actually published only one paper, and you'll see that's part one. And we don't know what happened to those 13 to 1400 specimens that went back to the UK. They've literally disappeared. So, okay, citizen science, maybe not at its best. Um, but then we have Richard Seaman who came along a few years later, and he worked with, with that same group of people, and they were local Aboriginal people. And it was through these people that Richard Seaman actually learned quite a few things. He did wonderful work. He did the first and most complete embryology work of the echidna. Then between 1893 uh, and uh, 1988, not a lot happened until I started working. <laughs> so in 1988, I started also um, with citizen scientists to find out, to try to solve the mysteries that still hadn't been discovered about echidnas. So if we go back to the questions that Owen had asked, in 1832, only really sort of two and a half of these had been answered. So it was actually Richard Seaman who found out from the Aboriginal people he were working with when echidnas actually um, mated. And so he did his work in the wintertime because that's when they said that the echidnas mated and he was able to do the embryology. How they nourished? Well, once they found out that they were egg-laying mammals, okay, then they, they knew that they were nourished inside the egg. Size, condition, and power of the young at birth. Before I started my studies in 1988, Mervyn Griffiths, who was my mentor, was the only person who had ever weighed and measured a newly hatched echidnas. So that left us with a lot of questions to answer. So how, uh, how echidnas mate, period of gestation, how long the mother suckles, age of sexual maturity, Bennett had asked how often they mate, and Seaman asked, how does the egg get to the pouch? So I'm here to tell you about outcomes. So 30 years later, have we answered these questions? Well, yes. Oh, that's right. And poor old Owen was dead. He was still alive. He was just still alive when they discovered that echidnas were an egg-laying mammal. But all these questions 100 years, 150 years later still had not been answered. Okay, so to solve echidna mysteries, you've got to find echidnas. So that's where citizen scientists came in. Hundreds of citizen scientists, thousands of hours, and it takes 300 hours of initial searching to find an echidna. Unless you're lucky and you find an echidna train during the breeding season. Then we had to put transmitters on the echidnas, and then we radio tracked echidnas for location observations, and we radio tracked and we radio tracked, sometimes in very not nice conditions, but citizen scientists are really keen to get out there. Do observations, more observations, documenting not only of what the echidnas were doing, but also the weather, what foods they were eating, and also filming their activities. That means a lot of data input, data input during the day and at night. So thousands of volunteers have actually contributed to this. So have we answered the questions? Yes. How do echidnas mate? Well, we know that courtship is for one to six weeks. There's these things called echidna trains. Unfortunately, I can't go into this in detail. People who know me know that I can talk all day about echidnas. Um, but it's, uh, they're really interesting, so the courtship behavior, the males don't fight. Um, finally, a female is receptive, and she actually mates with one male, and that's it, okay? And the mating takes place cloaca on cloaca. Also, the copulation lasts between 30, 30 to 120 minutes. Um, so this was actually my first publication in Scientific American, along with uh, Roger Seymour, and of course, because no one had ever actually described the mating of echidnas, people were also interested in the copulatory organ, which is quite unusual in the echidna and has caused a lot of interest. And also, this first publication was probably my best one. None of you have ever been misquoted, I'm sure? No? <laughs> the best misquote of, of any of my publications was this one, when this came out that echidnas had four dicks. <laughs> and, and of course, there were a number of things wrong, like the teeth are wrong, you know, the, everything's wrong. <laughs> Um, but to go on, so what about gestation? What was the time between, between mating and egg laying? Um, when I first started, there were things between six and 46 days. That was in the literature. And so after following echidnas, checking their pouches, actually seeing them copulate, then starting to follow them, we found out that um, the gestation is 22 days. So after 22 days, a single egg is laid in the pouch. And how does that egg get into the pouch? That egg gets into the pouch, again, after following echidnas and documenting echidnas, 
we actually found echidnas sort of sitting on their butt like this, and echidnas can do that. And in that, and in that sitting position, they can extrude their cloaca. And when they've extruded that cloaca, they can lay that one single egg into the pouch. And so we actually were able to get this on film. We were able to document it. But again, thousands of hours of observations, thousands of hours of field work. So there are other new questions. Once we knew you know, how the egg gets into the pouch, well, how does the female carry it? You know, does she carry it with her all the time? Is she you know, in and out? The beliefs were that she stayed into a burrow, but she doesn't. She actually can walk around with the egg in the pouch. She doesn't have a teat or a nipple for the young to attach to. It, they have a milk patch where they suckle the young. Those are my fingers, and that is a 12-hour-old echidna or a puggle. You can see the milk in the stomach, and you can see the milk patch. So I just have to go through quickly the growth, because the growth of echidna is, is, is amazing in the pouch. Again, that's my index finger. All of you have had a five-cent coin in your hand. It takes eight newly hatched echidnas to weigh as much as a five-cent coin. And before I started, only one of these had been documented. Okay, so there's my thumb for um, measurement. They grew, do grow quite rapidly. The milk of the female is very rich. There's two days of age. There's five days of age. You'll see that the color has changed. They're actually using skin respiration for the first few days of life. Nine days of age, they're nine grams. At hatching, they were 0.3 of a gram. 14 days, 35 days, getting back into the pouch. 52 days, okay, growth rates or something. Lots of things we've documented over these past 30 years. So how long is actually the young in the pouch? Well, we found out it's in the pouch for approximately 50 days. What happens after that? She digs a special nursery burrow and puts the young into the burrow. So the next question was, how often does she come back to actually suckle the young? So again, lots of volunteers, lots of citizen scientists sitting in trees for weeks on end for up to 18 hours a day, and we found out that mom comes back for only two hours every five days. I can tell you that cost a lot of chocolate. <laughs> Um, so how long does the mother suckle the young? The young is weaned at approximately seven months of age or 250 days. Small mothers wean small young, large mothers wean large young. That's very different than in any of our other wildlife. And that's, I give a lot of talks to wildlife care people. Age of sexual maturity. Well, that only took us about 15 years of research um, to actually follow known ages of young. We found out that there are a minimum of five and up to 12 years of age before a female actually produces her first young. Frequency of breeding. Well, again, you know, they used to think that echidnas were like platypus. They were, you know, sexually mature at two years. They'd have two youngs every, every year and, and so forth. All wrong. This is just a chart from one female, one of the longest females we know, Big Mama. Um, we know that some females, well, you can look at the chart yourself. She had, she had breeding, a couple times she had, she had breeding in two consecutive years. Usually it was every two years or every three years. And we're finding out that most females will breed, have one young every three to five years. So the recruitment, of course, is very, very slow. So thanks to volunteers and citizen scientists, the Kangaroo Island short-beaked echidna was EPBC listed as endangered in 2016. My opinion is that echidnas across Australia should be EPBC listed because whatever is happening on Kangaroo Island there might be worse things happening you know, on the mainland. The problem is you need to have that data. You need to have the long-term data for things like EPBC listings to happen. So you know, citizen scientists are very important. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my partner who's taken all these wonderful photographs and the thousands, literally thousands of scientists who have helped us over the past 30 years. And so citizen scientists, of course, all of us know are individuals making a difference.